Welcome to the wonderful world of the 8-track underground, the vanguard of the analog revolution. As the story goes, 8-track technology was thoroughly discredited in the late 1970s as cassettes began to take over the automobile recorded sound market. In the 1980s, 8-track was relegated to thrift stores, garage sales, and sad to say, landfills. But not everyone accepted this orchestrated demise. And this film is dedicated to those stubborn visionaries who have kept 8-track alive into the 90s. However, this is not just a chronicling of an underground network of 8-track eccentrics. This is a statement of active outrage and rebellion from a group of people who have opted out of a disposable consumer culture laid out for them to embrace in the spirit of growth or progress. Some of us are poor, some are rich, some are young, some are old, but we are all driven to reject the prevailing mood of conformity by an irresistible force deep within us. I'm Russ Forster, current editor of A-Track Mind magazine, and in March 1994, I struck out with Dan Sutherland on a 10,000-mile journey in search of other A-Track Minds. We began our loop in Chicago, where we spoke with Dave Vaccaro, C.G. Colson, Ryan and Brendan Murphy, Vito B., Jeff Economy, and Liz Russell. Perhaps the nagging tendency Chicago has to destroy magnificent old buildings so cardboard condos can take their places adds to the resolve of these Midwestern trailblazers. Being the owner of a home audio store myself, I find that uh, a lot of the customers are rather backward oriented, uh, maybe being driven by uh, marketing influences. Um, Many times people will come in and uh, say, well, everything's on CD today. Uh, you can't get nothing on other formats, record or a track. Um, and they just don't seem to have any use for them. Uh, yes, it's true, you can get a lot of re-releases on CD, but you would never be able to get everything. And uh, some people would go cold turkey and just abandon, abandon these other formats. And uh, the reality is, is this is this is backwards. I mean, what should be the most important is listening to the music you want to hear. I remember one time we were in the studio and we were recording, and you know it was a fairly contemporary studio, uh, but we had a 16-track tape machine and, and we, we felt, felt that we were getting good sounds but we put them on a cassette and they just didn't sound like anything that we'd ever heard on a record before. So we brought in an 8-track machine of mine that records and we dubbed some of our tunes down to 8-track and then we brought them out and we played them on various machines in the lobby. Uh, and that was one way of kind of validating the mix to see if it sounded like something that you'd recognized before that had a, a, the so a sound of real music which seems to so often be lacking from some of the recordings that they make in the studio these days. The whole point of format surfing is to get beyond the format, to, to really make them transparent, to get at the pure music itself. And every time you play an A-track, you know, the tape gets a little bit hazier, a little bit fuzzier, and you never know, is this the last time I'm going to hear this? So there's sort of this process, this transfer going on between the A-track and your memory, you know? It's almost like the music is physically going from the tape into your head, and you can play that loop over and over in your head. It's the clear 8-track. You can see inside of it, and so you can sort of see what goes on when one plays an 8-track. And so this is this is one of my favorites. Even though it does not play, it's broken. But you can, I guess, see what a, a broken 8-track looks like. <laughs> I found a copy of 8-track Mind uh, without even thumbing through it. I just bought it because I had acquired these 8-tracks. And then I kind of realized that, you know, maybe now, after reading it home, taking it home on the L and reading it, maybe now would be the time to get the player. Um, reading through the pages, I also saw that, you know, 8-tracks were kind of more of a lifestyle, that it wasn't just merely, you know, acquiring these things and pushing them into a player. Uh, kind of showed me that there were other people out there with similar interests, kind of a, a cartridge family, if you will. This machine comes with me in the shower. It's really wonderful, you know, it plays and plays and plays, and the only time I ever have problems with it is when the batteries are running out. It's never broken a tape. I mean, it's split a tape at the splice, but it's never, like, eaten a tape. Its twin has definitely eaten a number of tapes. But this is the machine I wanted when I was a little kid, and my parents, they were so unhip 
that uh, we didn't have an 8-track player at all. And I had these cousins who had a pickup truck with an 8-track player in it, and I thought it was the neatest thing on earth. I really liked the big ka-chunk sounds it would make when it would flip over. So when I saw this machine, I knew I had to have it. I uh, first bought a Panasonic player at a thrift store on Lincoln Avenue for $10 and got that home and it only played track three. Uh, so I decided that wasn't good enough and I negotiated with the guy to let me try some more players so I could find one that works. And then once it plugs in, I realized the magic of 8-track. I, I heard the clunking sounds, I had the tapes breaking. It was one of those small box pa Panasonics and I got it home, hooked it up, it played beautifully, 20 tapes. I tried all these new tapes, I was so excited. I put in uh, Double Platinum by Kiss and it played about half the song and then it just, it almost exploded. I mean, there was this horrible noise, like a screech. And then the machine just stopped dead and I pulled the tape out and you could see the tape in the, in the cassette still and it had been ripped in half, literally. One of my favorite 8-tracks is just called Disco Chicago uh, by DJ Jay Novak. It was recorded in January uh, 20th of 1978. I found this at a thrift store on the Wrigley Field, and it's just an incredible tape. The sound uh, quality rivals uh, any of my KTEL or other disco ones. And it just leads me to this curiosity, or almost like a voyeurism, of what this individual chose to put on this tape. When was this tape used? Uh, how many disco parties was it at? And then why all of a sudden did they uh, decide to discard it? One of the advantages that A-Track had over the cassette, which really uh, caught my eye or ear, you could say, back then, uh, was the fact that it was pretty much running parallel with uh, quadraphonic sound. This is the black motion picture experience. It's quadraphonic. I, of course, don't have a quadraphonic player, but I suppose it sounds really good on quad. It sounds pretty good on stereo as well. It's got a number of hits on it. It's very, very, very mellow. It's uh, kind of like Barry White meets Curtis Mayfield. This here is a bunch of uh, Rudy Ray Moore uh, and other assorted sort of comedy albums. Uh, Mr. Billy McAllister and uh, Rudy Ray Moore presents the second Lady Reed album, Will the Real Dick Rise? This is all part of the Kent collection, which many people knowledgeable uh, and otherwise talk about, and I don't know too much about it, but the stuff is funny, damn it, it's funny. You may or may not have heard about this. It was called the L Cassette. Uh, it was uh, brought out basically in the late 70s, and uh, the idea behind it was very good. Basically what they did was take all the good points of your A-track uh, and cassette and uh, put it into a new format at that time called the L-cassette. Uh, runs at three and three quarter ips, uses a uh, quarter inch tape, is four tracks, two tracks in each direction. Uh, this is actually the only format I can say sounded like honest to God, real to real. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was basically audiophile type uh, format which was coming out and many of the manufacturers had uh, banded together at its introduction uh, to show their distaste in the format because they uh, felt that uh, there was too many formats on the market at the time and they didn't need an additional format which was very unfortunate. Berlin, which was uh, another mystery to me. And I got it and of course was uh, depressed for about a month in high school. I listened to almost nothing else but Berlin and just walked around with this kind of shattered mopey look on my face all the time. And of course it goes on this endless loop so you can get depressed all over again from the beginning. But later I heard it on a, at a friend's house, I think maybe I bought the LP, I don't remember. And uh, something sounded strange. So I went back and I checked on the A-track and uh, in between Berlin and Lady Day, first two tracks, there's about 30 seconds of incidental music on there that is not on the LP. Hey, this brings back some memories. Pussy Galore, Dial M for MF, uh, A track, which we spent uh, the summer of 90 and uh, probably the summer of 91 as well just listening to. We were always hanging out up on the roof down there on uh, Erie. And 
and uh, sitting up on the deck, and somebody always played this all the time. And my reason for buying a portable was uh, that record. <laughs> that 8-track. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think for like two years, we might not have listened to anything more than this. Yeah, except for maybe Roxy Music's first record oh, yeah. on 8-track. Their best record. Possibly the greatest album ever made. Yeah, I agree. I was, uh in a bar one night in uh, Bucktown. And uh, throughout the course of the evening, I met this young lady who would later become my regular girlfriend. And throughout the course of the night, we hit it off rather well, and it came time to leave. And I was gonna offer a ride home, but then I realized that I had uh, eight tracks all over my dashboard, and uh, I didn't want to kind of blow this chance. So I kind of hemmed and hawed, and uh, th then we decided, well, okay, we'll have it there. And I said, well, maybe it's dark out and uh, the car was under street light. Maybe she wouldn't notice the eight tracks. I'm kind of guilty now that I felt ashamed about it. And she was kind of nervous about getting in the car with someone she didn't know. Um, but then when she saw the eight tracks on the dashboard, she immediately started laughing. And it, it really did kind of put her at ease in a way. She thought that if anyone would put eight tracks on, that they, uh, they couldn't be all bad. Dan and I drove 36 hours straight from Chicago to Seattle, Washington, where we talked with John Peterson, a reclusive genius with a heart as big as a pioneer quad player. We asked Mr. Peterson to show us his unique techniques for repairing 8-track tapes gone awry. He was obliging, but too fast for us to follow, so we asked him to try it again, slower. Take a pair of scissors, one end, and bust off the locking tabs. Open up the cartridge, take out the tape from either side, take some scotch tape, put the tape underneath the cartridge tape. Cut. William Lear of Learjet fame is partially responsible for the stickiest tape failure, the malevolent melting pinch roller. Drill out these three locking pins to take apart the cartridge. Pry open the cartridge using a mat knife, being careful not to spill the tape. Drop in the new pinch roller. Our analog heritage risen as a phoenix. Imbued with the knowledge that 8-track failures are not insurmountable, we forged ahead to Portland, Oregon to visit two of our favorite proponents of the 8-track lifestyle, Gene Earhart and Marcy James. Ms. Earhart is a creative whirlwind a painter and writer who composes with a track player always close at hand. Ms. James spends much of her time in a most amazing storage space filled with goodies from a time barely past. Party! Party! Kippo's eyes rolled back. Sure sounds like one, Kippo, I said. Come! Kippo grabbed my arm. Party with Kippo! I don't think so, Kippo, I said. It's late. Cut and run, I thought. Not exactly sure what that even meant. Kippo says, party with the death squad. Kippo flung open the door. This is my storage locker. I keep all of my 8-track collection down here. My storage space is really cheap, so it's only $25 a month, so I'm able to save more money and buy more 8-tracks to add to my collection. I bring all my new 8-tracks down that I collect, and I alphabetize them all right here, and all my new 8-track players come right here in my little 8-track shrine, and I spend a lot of time down here. I come down here, relax, just escape from reality, and it's my secret little 8-track hideaway. Without warning, Kippo reached over and lifted the needle from the record, bringing the frantic music to an abrupt halt. The room became deadly quiet except for the sound of Monique catching her breath. Wiki, Kippo said, pointing at me. Everything I have in my storage space, I used to have in a store that was called Funkin' Groove in Portland, Oregon. And the store was basically 70s retro with um, 70s clothing and tons of 8-tracks and 70s memorabilia. And people would come in and buy 8-tracks and buy clothes. And it was just a really cool place to hang out. And But now that I don't have my store anymore, I moved everything down here into storage. Hello, everyone, I muttered, never feeling more out of place in my life. The ex eyed me from under a sweaty mop of blonde hair, her mouth slightly agape. I wondered if the axe had been named after a rather hatchet-shaped nose. This is um, my heartthrob, and I have posters of him throughout my storage locker. And I love Eric because he looks over me while I'm listening to all my eight tracks, 
and my dream is for Eric Estrada to come visit me and my entire 8-track collection. Hey, you wiki, said Ozzy, the axe's younger sister, a willow-thin, high-strung version of the axe. She sucked on a joint and passed it up to Monique. These are my favorite 8-track players. Um, the first one I have is really fun because it, like, you can spin it around and, like, no matter where you're at in the room, if you want to face in a different direction, you can turn it around. They're really durable. They weigh a lot, but, and they're hard to find. You can't really find very many of them, but it has an 8-track player. It's got the AM, FM radio, which I don't like, usually use, but it's great. So I like these ones, and they come in really cool colors. Monique twisted her waist-length auburn hair into a top knot, then crouched down on the desk. She took a deep puff on the joint. I tried not to stare at her perfect, plump breasts. Hello, Wiki, Monique said, continuing to hold in the smoke. She glared at Kippo. Now will you put the fucking music back on? My second one I like is, like, the atomic, like, I don't know, like a dynamite one, I guess you'd call it, because you can get mad, and if you're really mad, you can just, like, slam it down like that, and it's kind of, like, fun to play with. So, and you can spin this thing around. It doesn't do anything, but... Um, and these come in a lot of different colors. I've had them in red, and I've had them in blue, and these are great because they're fun to play with. That's the reason I like them. Ozzy giggled. The axe's eyebrows shot up. The freezer stared out the window into the dark. Come on, Kippo, the ex said. She strummed her racket. The music? This is my favorite one to date right now because it's very glamorous and you'll be like the hottest thing in town with it because you can wear it over your shoulder like a purse and it's got a secret compartment in the back where a microphone comes out so you can sing along with it. Kippo dropped to her knees and began to pull records from the apple crate that held a record collection. Monique sighed. She passed the joint back to Ozzy. Why doesn't someone get Miss Wiki a beer? This one I got like a month ago. It's the door sealed on 8-track, the very first one. And originally they wanted $6.98 for it. Total ripoff. But I got it from a dollar, this guy at a garage sale. Oh, no thanks, I said, backing toward the door. But thanks. Cut and run, I thought. Cut and run. This one, right on, I like it because... The chick is like really 70-ish and very, very foxy, and she's like, hey, you know? Party, Kippo shouted. With that, the stereo needle skated over the record. This one doesn't have a cover on it, but it's like my favorite 8-track out of all of them because it's the kids from the Brady Bunch, and that is so hard to find. I've never seen the Brady Bunch anywhere, and it has all the songs on it. It has It's a Sunshine Day keep on and everything has all the great ones on it so this is my favorite one out of all of them this is the place i got banned from goodwill for life goodwill used to be my favorite thrift store to go to that's where most of my eight tracks came from and i used to go there for like two years getting eight tracks and then the same guy used to bring out eight tracks all the time for me and he used to let me go through them and put them on the shelf and i got first pick at everything and then one day he stopped working there and this new lady came so i'm like it's okay you know just do you have any eight tracks and she was like no we don't have any eight tracks and i go sure you do that you know the other guy used to bring them out for me all the time and she's like well let me go check you know and she like brought out like four eight tracks and like didn't even bring me a box full to go through or anything and this lady was just really mean. She was really grouchy, and like I was pestering her about the eight tracks, you know, which were really important. But she didn't seem like that. She was like, "Well, go buy some tapes or some records," you know. And I was like, "No, you know, I want some eight tracks." And so one day she didn't come in until later. So I thought, okay, I know they're in the back room. So I went to the back room and said employees only, but I went back there anyway. And I walked through there and I was looking all around, and in the back was like boxes of like eight tracks and so I, I opened up the box and there was like the doors there was Lou Reed there was just all all these eight tracks that were just like really good shape and good condition so I got a bunch of them that I wanted and I went and I bought them you know left the boxes back there so when she came in that day I go do you have any eight tracks to bring out she goes no we don't have any eight tracks you know I keep telling you that why are you pestering me about it 
And so I knew right then, okay, there's no more 8-tracks. She's not going to bring them out. So I kept going back into the back room and getting 8-tracks. And then one day she caught me. She came in early. And she goes, what are you doing back here? This is for employees only. And I said, I'm getting these 8-tracks. You know, they should be out on the floor. She goes, look here, Missy. I follow certain rules, and all these 8-tracks are going to take up room, and no one buys them anyway. They're just junk. And I was like, you know, this isn't right. You know, you should bring these 8-tracks out. I buy them. She goes, well, you're going to have to go down and talk to our manager. So I went through this big ordeal. It ended up that they banned me from Goodwill for life. I never allowed back into Goodwill. When we told Marcy our next stop was California, she had this to say. One of the reasons I like living in Portland, Oregon, as opposed to California, is because if I had, an earth, if there was an earthquake, my 8-tracks would totally fall all over. Throwing caution to the wind, we drove down the coast to San Francisco. There, we finally met Blake Weatherspoon, our favorite eight-track troubadour, having missed him during his stays in Austin, Anchorage, and Chicago. I uh, started a fanzine about a couple years ago, and I put in um, an article about eight-tracks, and the response was really pretty good. It was varied. I had uh, some people writing in and saying that they remembered eight-tracks, and one, one person wanted to actually put out some new stuff on um, an 8-track, and so he was asking me about my recorder, and um, my dad's response was to send me all his old 8-tracks. And a fine collection of 8-track tapes was born. These are my favorite 8-tracks. Here's James Brown. It's uh, just a great, great release. Can't get any better than this, especially on 8-track. Kind of rare. Mystic Moods. It's the uh, sort of quintessential sound of the 70s. It's for uh, hot dates and stormy nights. Belly Dance at Go-Go. This has absolutely nothing to do with go-go dancing, but if you try real hard, I'm sure you can get, get down to it. And last but not least, Telly Savalas. Who loves you, baby? Enough said. And if those tapes don't grab you... These are my Ronco tapes. Uh, I got them at a mammoth music sale in Chicago, Illinois to benefit Lou Gehrig's disease. And I was pretty psyched because they're still in the wrapper. Um, my first ever 8-track was a K-Tel, and these are very similar. We asked where else these great tapes came from. The past two summers I spent traveling around the country and going to thrift stores along the way and looking for 8-tracks. And I've noticed that there's a lot of different places where 8-tracks, they, they vary from state to state and region to region. And I found that on either coast, it's really, well, for me, it was really hard to find 8-tracks. And I noticed that on the West Coast, there's a lot of kind of more hippie music and like Grateful Dead and that kind of thing. And um, it seems like the Midwest is a pretty decent place to find 8-tracks. The Midwest might be good, but Sparks, Nevada is probably the best place to find 8-tracks. Who would suspect that only a few miles from Reno's blackjack tables and one-armed bandits lie entrepreneurial activities that would even leave the mob scratching its collective head? We visited a man who was paying off his house mortgage by selling 8-tracks. Presented for the sake of cognitive dissonance, Mr. Tim Hunter. I picked up a Yoko Ono uh, sealed tape, can't remember the title. Uh, for a quarter, went into a San Francisco record store and saw the same out the uh, the LP sealed for sixty dollars. Now I said to myself, "There's got to be something wrong here. The album is sixty dollars sealed. No one's going to go home and play that, so it's a collectible. A quarter for the eighth track. It certainly has the same credentials as the LP for being a collectible." And I said, "There's something wrong here. This is either too high or this is too low." And I figured this was too low at a quarter, so I decided there was some uh, interesting potential in eight tracks at that time. We were given the privilege of witnessing Mr. Hunter's closet of 8-track delights, most still sealed. While we were snooping around his office, the phone brought him a typical commercial opportunity. Traffic and uh, Eric Clapton and that sort of stuff. So I got Iron Butterfly. Yeah, we got Iron Butterfly. What are you looking for? Heavy? Uh, I think I'm on a 4-track. Again, you don't care about that. Yeah, uh, any traffic in particular? These people would basically buy and want to finish their group uh, group collection, or they collect a certain period of time, being late 60s, or they collect certain 
eras, the punk era, the Iggy and the Stooges, Ted Nugent type of thing. Uh, cult bands in particular have their following. I, my favorite, probably the most requested uh, group of, by far is Kiss. Unfortunately, there's 25 common Kiss 8-tracks and three rare ones, and everybody's after the three rare ones. As you get more involved, you start looking for those large inventories, those large leftover inventories of 8-tracks that are just sitting around and people are willing to give them away. For instance, buying 30,000 of them for $450 in Lancaster. It seems incredible, 2.3 cents or something. It ended up cost me 48 cents when I got back. But that's not as quite as exciting as it used to be in the thrift stores, going in and seeing amongst uh, Dolly Parton and the uh, Partridge family and uh, uh, Henry Mancini and the kind of strings in between those is a velvet underground, somehow or another, some, <laughs> something like that, or finding a box full that uh, nobody's seen yet and knowing almost by the labels and the colors of the plastic, whether they're good or bad, uh, you get a second sense about that. But the thrift store, unfortunately, is a dying thing. In fact, uh, the Goodwills now, I don't think they even carry them with the carpeting and the in, in the stores and all that sort of thing. It was a rainy sort of day, and a guy had an 8-track player on top of an 8-track holder. And I said, you got any 8-tracks in there? And he says, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you could never get to them. We had to take their, their record player and everything off. And in, in amongst that was uh, original Disco Duck by Rick Dees. Uh, I'd never seen it before. And to me, this epitomizes uh, the uh, absurdity of collecting eight tracks. <laughs> I, this is the last tape I'd want to sell, I think, for whatever stupid reason. But anyway, the guy, the guy, I picked out Rick Dees, and he looked at it, and in his eyes was a, a really sad look. He goes, no, don't take the duck. Don't take the duck. And I go, sorry, man. And, you know, and he agreed to sell it for a quarter, but he was genuinely sad to see the disco duck leave. And, uh, 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 I guess that sums up some people's feelings when they see some part of their youth being taken away. We returned to the earthquake zone to visit my old friend and confidant, Terry Burns, a.k.a. Burnsy. He was nice enough to take a day off from work, well, actually he called in sick, to show us around his 8-track collection and around his town, San Diego, California. Right at the end of college, um, I said... I found the 8-track tapes that I did have at my mother's house were all down in the basement at that point in boxes. And um, I took them out and sorted through them and brought out the new wave ones and like B-52s and stuff and brought them back and gave them to people who had an 8-track player so that we could hear them. And I never in a million years would have thought that I would have an 8-track player or I probably would have saved all that stuff, but that's just how it goes. Ferrell's is a lot like 8-track, just in the fact that it hasn't changed in 20 years or more, but mostly the thing that's nice about Ferrell's and 8-track is the music because they have player pianos here, and the player piano's on a roll, which is like the 8-track tape, which is on a big roll. But the music selections, they've got... Um, like Tony Orlando and Don, and um, theme from Casino Royale, and um, God, what's that other song? Angel in the Morning. Angel in the Morning. How, should we sing it? Um, how does it go? Um, Wait, take my hand, said something. Just call me Angel in the morning, Angel. Just touch my brush your teeth before you leave, baby. Once you start searching around in these thrift stores, or at least you could a few years ago, you'd find 8-track tapes buried under things, literally buried at this one Salvation Army there were these old units that at one time at a retail store probably held hosiery, and there were drawers and drawers and drawers full of A-tracks. Um, they had been in there for years. Um, no one knew they were there. When I wanted to buy them, no one in the store would sell them because they didn't know how much to ask for them because no one that worked there had ever sold one before. San Francisco, I had these two roommates, um, Mary, who I had been corresponding with through the mail for a while, and um, she knew I liked 8-track tapes and was sending me tapes for a couple years at that point, point. and when we all moved into this house together, 
it just like took off like a storm. The only stereo we had was the 8-track that I'd brought up from San Diego. And um, we'd go thrift shopping. There was a store like a couple blocks from our house where we outfitted the whole place with. And it, it was like a contest pretty much. And on wasn't a like official contest like we're gonna see who can collect the most A-track stuff but it just turned out that way the players just started to flood into the house at one point we had three of these we had every color that they came in and then I had gotten this one in the mail still in its original box it was an incredible day it was the same day that the yellow one and the red one had entered our lives and we had a set. Mary, one afternoon, came home almost, she seemed to be almost to the point of crying. She had found in the thrift store, she said, a large white A-track player that looked like a bowling ball, only it had a handle. And she had to have it and the people in the store wouldn't sell it to her. <laughs> You know, CDs just, I don't know, it just doesn't work out because they get stolen. They have market value. So um, when you get robbed, that sort of thing disappears. But when you get robbed, they never take your 8-track tapes. This place is the biggest joke. Um, they always tell me, like the executives, they go up and they, they, always, they like to say, you know, we're all about fashion here and... And you need to try to be a little more about fashion, too. And mostly they like to yell at me about what I'm wearing, which is stupid because I'm the display person. And what difference does it make what I'm wearing? I mean, I really don't understand their concern. But it's gone on so much that I really can't stay here anymore. And, uh, I mean, this is 6th Avenue. What difference does it make? This is, Nobody's going to ever shop in this store and it's doomed. I, I, I give it about six months and it'll be closed down for sure. A few weeks later, Bernsey sent me this newspaper clipping. Perhaps Saks would have survived if it had been run by Dallas 8-track retailer James Big Bucks Burnett. Hi, I'm Mr. Bucks from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to 14 Records, Texas leading 8-track retail outlet. Let's come on in and look at some formats. We got living formats, Dead formats and formats that haven't even been invented yet. So grab a beverage. Come on in. This is a As a store owner, I find great joy in meeting 8-track customers uh, in Dallas or through the mail. I'm corresponding with 8-track collectors from all over America and even other countries as well. And it's really refreshing to know that truly the 8-track as a format is not forgotten. I'm Mr. Bucks, the 8-track Messiah. If we do not care for the 8-track, who will? I feel as owner of 14 Records, I have a very unique perspective on 8-track tapes in that I attempt to sell them directly to the public nearly every day of my life. And if you think about it, that's a fairly tall order to sell this dead, unwanted format, truly the orphan of musical formats, to the mainstream public in the middle of Yuppieville, USA. And you know what? It happens. Nearly every day I sell at least one or two eight tracks for anywhere from a dollar, three dollars, five dollars each, or up. Perhaps the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me in the, the uh, retail capacity in which I serve would have to be that fateful day in early July 1992 when a guy a little younger than me walked into my store and handed me $100 for the Sex Pistols 8-track that I had on the wall with a big $100 price tag. And when he said, I'd like to buy the Sex Pistols 8-track, I said, well, sir, that 8-track is $100. He said, I know, I can read, and he handed me a $100 bill. We, the 8-track collectors, traders, dealers, and lovers of America, really kind of have to hoard together, also known as networking, to literally preserve every working 8-track cartridge on the planet. Here we have perhaps the only 
eight track of its kind in existence. This is a quad eight track with a 3D album art cover by Grand Funk Shiny On released in 1974. You bring out the 3D glasses, you look at the 3D eight track quad cover, you are tripping Bill Clinton wood in hell, I guarantee it. Here is one of the oddest eight track or tape formats known to men, the beautiful, the luxurious Learjet Stereo 8 folding 8-track tape. Check it out. It's a little 8-track that folds in half to give it some compactability from the late 60s. Maybe about five of these on the planet. Uh, it's too beautiful for words. I'll just shut up. Jimi Hendrix, Bold as Love on beautiful two-track tape, also known as the play tape. Look at the size of this. EPs on a miniature eight-track format. At last, we come to the most primitive, the very first tape cartridge format known to the human race. This is the Ortronic tapeette. I call it the donut eight-track because of its round shape. But just look that in, take it in, will you? Just enjoy its beautiful quality. You know, you see something like this, you say, that came from another planet. And I say, no, it came from your home planet, Earth. Just in from Fort Worth, Texas, a good friend of mine and fellow collector, Mr. Lynn Fuller. Uh, Lynn, I hear you have a, a brand new old format that we haven't even talked about yet. One more. One more to add yeah, to our we... collection. It's a cassette format, but it's four track. Probably late mid 60s late 60s with the rca player the eight track as a format as a lifestyle really to me sums up the beauty of obscurity itself and obscurity i'm finding more and more as time passes comes to mean much more to me than the more established formats of music and entertainment um, in other words why listen to the Beatles for the 50 millionth time when you can play that third Tiny Tim album that even Tiny Tim fans may not be that familiar with? Take it a step further. Buy the third Tiny Tim album on 8-track, 4-track, 2-track. Make yourself the Tiny Tim format pack. So you see, there's really no limit to obscurity. We braved the backwoods near Austin, Texas to talk with Corey Greenberg, Enfant Terrible of Stereophile magazine, about his 8-track stash. For the past three and a half years, I've been writing for this magazine called Stereophile, which is a high-end audio publication, and it's about the extreme high-end of stereo equipment and audio equipment. And it's been a little bit difficult for me to relate to a lot of the people that read the magazine, because a lot of times, real high-end audiophiles who spend multi-thousands of dollars on their systems have a much closer relationship with the gear than with the music. A lot of audiophiles have skeletons in their closet, like they listen to rock and roll music, but they don't want to admit it, and they have eight tracks, and they don't want to admit it, but when they see and printed story file suddenly is validated and I got cards and letters from people saying that they hauled their 8-track out of the you know cobwebs for the first time in 10 years we're having a great time with it and what's interesting to me is that it almost seems like these people are having a much better time listening to their 8-tracks than they are listening to their CDs and their LPs on their very expensive gear because uh, when, you, when, you, when you take away the sort of rat race to get the best kind of sound quality oftentimes you can relax a little bit and enjoy the music on its own terms. You know, the average Joe just does not have $16 a pop to, to try out a, a lot of new music. It, it can really rack up, and so people are getting a lot more selective about their tunes. With 8-tracks, you can go into a pawn shop or, you know, some thrift shop or whatever and buy 5 to a dollar some places, which, you know, which I've been doing lately, and um, checking out all sorts of music that I would never blow $16 a pop to check out, like uh, the collected works of Merle Haggard. You know, I love Merle Haggard, but I'm not going to spend $16 a pop to buy every CD, but I have, like, all Merle Haggard tapes. Mr. Greenberg's glowing description of my magazine reads like a press release. 8-Track Mind isn't a crummy little cobbled together fanzine. It's a serious, informative guide written by and for enthusiasts who clearly enjoy what they're doing a hell of a lot more than we seem to. Just read the letter section in 8-Track Mind and Stereophile and you tell me who's having a better time. 
since your article came out, a lot of people took it upon themselves to send me A track players to uh, to have and to listen to, and I got all these crazy A tracks, uh, not only tapes but also players from all over the country. And this one guy sent me four A track players, and uh, none of them really worked very long. They all lasted about you know probably an average of 25 minutes. But you know this 25 minutes for each one is really cool. And the best one he sent me was this great uh, Welltronics like spaceship helmet, white plastic round thing that was uh, you know the baddest thing I'd ever seen. I always sort of thought of it as being one of these peripheral fringe uh, 70s kitsch movements, you know, like lava lamps or you know all that kind of crap. But the truth of it is that the vast majority of people that I've met that are into a track and that have the players and that trade the tapes are like seriously hardcore into music. And the reason that they're into a track is not because it's some you know some youthful thing that they're they're reliving, but it's actually a way for them to to get the, the, the widest possible array of music uh, without mortgaging their house. Next stop on the a track caravan tour of the South was New Orleans. Things were hard to keep in focus given the food, drink, and heat. But former 8-track mind staffer Doug Von Hopp brought us back to Earth with his 8-track fantasy triptych, My Vision for America. He shows how 8-track improves the lives of nymphomaniacs, pyromaniacs, and just plain maniacs, and quite possibly you and me. Heading north to High Point, North Carolina, we called on Eric Wilson to explain the technical superiority of A-Track. I first realized how what I was on to when I saw a, a digital versus analog comparison on the MTV News. Uh, it really threw me for a loop. I never expected to find anything uh, useful on MTV, let alone interesting. Uh, the analog wave, uh, you get a lot of you get a lot of nice naturalistic curves uh, like you'll find on an oscilloscope. It, it is a tr it's a real representation of the continuous uh, pattern of the sound. Uh, the digital wave uh, is where you run into some problems because you get sort of a blocky type of Manhattan skyline uh, thing. And uh, the sa and the samples are like seven. It's about seventeen thousand samples a second. Uh, 
but there is some space in between those samples. You might not be able to hear it, but the mm, subtle, subtler nuances of the music tend to fall uh, through the holes. The tape had wound backwards on the reel so that uh, the slick part was on the outside. It's, and one day it just broke right at the splice. Uh, we, I spent about an hour and a half one night winding this back onto the real right way. Uh, it plays uh, sort of. Sometimes the tracks won't change. Sometimes when you change a track, you get a low sort of a uh, blah feedback type of. And uh, the best thing to do with that is I've tracked it down to the to the fan that it has inside to cool the components and uh, just whap it right there a couple of times. It'll be good as gold. It also You also get some uh, static uh, when you put it on certain tapes and some tapes are a little sluggish and you know it's just <clears throat> well it's just like a it's just like a girlfriend only without a lot of the money there. This is uh, the type of uh, eight track pirate collection that you were bound to find at any truck stop or stuckies or whatever uh, during the early 70s before they uh, cracked down on the copyright laws. Uh, this, at the bottom in really tiny print it says that the statutory uh, copyrights uh, were paid to the music publishers, which is their way of saying, well, we think it's legal, but we can't be too sure. Uh, the the uh, tapes are all just mastered right off of the 45s. Uh, during the during a Grand Funk Railroad song on this one, uh, you can hear the record uh, jump the groove several times, and they didn't even bother to fix it. That's real capitalism at work for you. Christine Williams is one of A-Track Mind's most beloved writers, having sent her first piece to the magazine at age 16. Her heartfelt accolades and lamentations for A-Track as it fit into her turbulent teenage years made for continually compelling reading. I mean, I never heard of a fanzine by A-Tracks before. And when I got it, I read it and I liked it a lot because I can relate to the articles and the people seem sensible enough. This one is David Bowie's Heroes, and I got this one from Mr. Bucks, and I didn't know what else was on it besides the title track. And after I really got to love in it, and I, I just didn't want anything to go wrong with it. I thought it would be all right. And when I was depressed about a year and a half ago or so, and it started to go haywire, then I just went downhill because tape meant a lot to me, and I liked to play it a lot during while I did my geometry homework. But it's all right now because I bought it on CD. And I still play this occasionally. It, it gives better sound than the CD. Christine met New York Renaissance woman Abigail Levine through A-Track Mind. Abigail and I are like the same type of people, um, same type of clothes. She wears black a lot. I like to wear black. I can't wear it a lot because I'm a glummy get black all the time. But, well, I wear it when I can. I thought I always wanted to be really outgoing and and uh, I mean in a really extravagant way, but well, she's not like that, and um, so I just rather not be that way either. Many of Christine's favorite eight tracks are hand-me-downs from a time she can't possibly remember. They belong to my uncle. They're from about '76 or so, and this is just uh, soft rock like Neil Diamond and America and um, Rhinestone Cowboys on here, and Philadelphia Freedom is on this one a lot without John on it a lot kind of sick we asked christine to talk about her future plans most of which had more to do with abigail than with a track i'd like to go live in new york one day or either any other big city raleigh's nice but i don't know if i can't make it in new york um i'll probably come back down to raleigh but i i'd like to go to college um in new york i don't really Whenever I think of going to a college here in the state, I don't, I don't like that idea. But, and if I do go to college, I think I might, if they have a good library program, library science program, then I'll probably try to get my degree in that because um, well, being a librarian, I think that'll probably be some good work, you know, as support for my writing and whatever. Though she grew up in the age of CD, Christine still has formative memories involving 8-track. The village people, this is really great because 
See, I used to love the song YMCA a lot, and we went to the store one night and they were selling it, but for some reason the lady wouldn't let us have it. I can't, of course, I can't remember why. But um, so I went home disappointed, and then the next day when I came home from preschool, Mom showed me this brown bag, and I looked in, and there it was, and I was so happy. And so the music on here is not bad either, but I love disco. I can't help it. I don't like to watch the movies that are out today because, well, not the movies that come to the theaters, but um, because um, they don't appeal to me in the sense that they're too commercialized and they're too um, fluffy, but. Um, I like to write about such things like uh, homosexuality, um, which I'm not, I'm straight, but I like homosexuals. It's, um, um, and let's see, I don't know, uh, punk rockers, me being um, alienated, stuff like that, just, just in general, uh, alienations. Formerly housed in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but now residing in Washington, D.C., rock idols Gumball have a mountain of over 25,000 8-tracks. They use the stash for inspiration, grabbing piles of steel tapes to play when the beer kicks in. Their story belongs in the tabloids. It all started kind of by accident. We were looking at tapes at one of our favorite places, Porter's Furniture, and we were kind of disgusted with their selection that day. It was just a <laughs> lot of crap that we already And we knew on. that they had more, because they have tons of records. And, and they, they made some comment about, you want some tapes? We got a whole garage full of tapes. And that, was that Shorty that said that? Uh, I can't remember who came. I think it was actually Old Man Porter. Old Man Porter. Who actually put the bait out first. He tossed us the bait. And we said, well, how many are you talking? You know, we figured, ah, uh, he's got, you know, 10 boxes of these. And he said, uh, 30,000. 30,000? He tracks. And we tapes. said, uh, 30,000 tapes? And he was like, yeah, they're all back in the garage. I'll show them to you. Still interested. sealed. And he wasn't kidding. He had them back there. They'd been there for about 10 years, and they'd just brought out a box or two every, whenever they needed them, I guess. For the whenever store. we bought enough. And yeah, they, <laughs> were, they weren't selling too many. As you will see, the Misty label has trees and beautiful play Misty for me, titles and songs and bands. Tell us a few, Malcolm. Well, it also, also says the soft sounds here at the bottom, but... Of course, this tape here, the Rock Revival, is anything but soft. It's really hard. That's one of the hot ones, too. Yeah, it's one, one of the hot. best. That Except and Motorcycle Mama, which, unfortunately, we've lost we've in our place. trove of 25,000 A-tracks. With the number one hit tune, I Got Stuff in My I Got head. Stuff in my, <laughs> on My Mind. On My Mind. Yeah, something like that. The Rock Alliance. The Rock Alliance. Yeah. The Rock Alliance, The Rock Revival. They were just like musical whores. They just did everything, copied everybody. It's excellent. And you, we don't know who any of them are. Nope. There's never any names of no anybody. No names, no faces. Just, well, except for this face right here on the Oscar Romano Orchestra. Now, the ATI label is also the other big find, wouldn't you say? Mm, the with American the decibels. label, yeah. Yeah. The decibels, the fabulous decibels. They do uh, every genre of music known to man. All quite badly, but in their own way, it's uh, and equally bad. Yeah, it, but they, they make they do a uh, shaft. Oh no, Superfly. They do Superfly. Make it sound like Devo. <laughs> yeah, they do they make do, it sound like Devo. Uh, well, the Who. They do country. The they yeah. do the Who. Although we've only found part two, we found several copies of part two and so far no part one. We believe in the integrity of the collection. That is correct. It's more, it is a library as opposed to you know we're not. We're not a store such as Big Bucks. No, we're not going to be. We're not going to be putting price tags on these not gems. Not for sale. Not for sale. It's a museum to us. It's our personal museum at the moment. But you never know. Someday we might have the resources to bring the collection to the people. But we usually take a couple of, well, sometimes a couple of suitcases. You know, you have to have, I don't know, a few hundred eight tracks definitely on tour. Right. Plus, we had to carry well, this transformer. Especially in you're not going to find any new ones. We had to carry a transformer with us that was the size of a car battery. <laughs> It was a huge, heavy thing. We would lug it into the dressing room, plug it in. We had all these different adapters. Oh, that's actually every we country have three has players part. because we've got one for John on stage. We well, come now on, it's right. In we there. come on, you know, to music, cool breeze, an eight track, and that has to be ready to go every night. And now our sound man has one built in to his rack. It's got all your digital crap and then the eight track. Looks good in there too. 
This is it. The our best and the brightest. I love some of our favorites. My favorite Dukes yes. of Hazard guitar. We got the Mark Don and Mel box set. Looking very nice. Excellent. Got a little Mingus Moose quadraphonic 8 track. Quadraphonic. Oh, man. There's Tattoo, our little buddy here. We One of my favorites, especially for the road, the Paul Harvey biography. Oh, very special. Oh, very nice. Very nice. What do we have? We got a light. I, I love this one. Soft Machine, eight track. Oh. First album. My favorite, Kiss Alive 2, and all the Kiss signatures. Flaming Thank you very movies. much. Woo. Now, let me shoot a quick yeah. demo. Beetlejuice. Uh, Beetlejuice. Water Lou Reed. Rock and roll Berlin. all night. Signed. Little Beetlejuice. And Metal party machine. every day. Lou Reed. Signed. Woo. Lou Reed. Signed. Signed. Big Beetlejuice. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Todd needs a better cover, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Todd, no cover, extra limited. Pet sounds with an excellent cover. <laughs> Always nice oh. on eight track. Yep. In addition to playing some really wild organ and guitar for Gumball, Malcolm Riviera has some amazing acquisitions in his personal collection. We asked him to take some time out from his globe hopping schedule to give us some background on his most exquisite collectibles. You know, I started collecting them, you know, a couple years ago, even though, um, irony of ironies, I used to really, really hate the smile face. I mean, back in the 70s, it was just the worst commercial, you know, crap to me. You saw it on everything, and I hated it. And and now, for some reason, I really like the smiley face, and I, I go out of my way to find them. And um, it was never copyrighted, so, you know, you can put smiley face on anything. So, uh, you know, you could start your own line of smiley face products, and it would be perfectly legal. Um, but the original smiley face is the stuff I like best. Like I have some ceramic um, items. They're uh, some McCoy ceramics and like the Have a Happy Day cookie jar and the coffee mugs. I really like that stuff. There's a whole line of that. It's a nice compact unit, but it separates into two pieces so you can get a really good stereo sound. You pop this top handle back and uh, it's on a hinge. So you just separate the two halves and you can just set them beside each other pretty close, or if you've got room, spread it way apart and get a really incredible stereo effect. And the, all the cords are stored in the back in a nice little compartment. And you can run it on batteries, or um, if you need to run it inside, it'll plug into an electrical outlet, or you can even use it on a car uh, system, so it has the 12 volt car battery adapter, uh, just about everything you need. This was uh, my great-grandmother's 78 player that I inherited, and you know we used to play with it when we were kids, and I finally uh, got it and had it restored, and it works great. Uh, the only thing I don't really have are enough needles. It uses these little stainless steel needles that are very sharp, but amazingly, they wear out really after only one or two plays, even though most people don't know that. So you have to, uh, you know, the real aficionados replace the needle after every play, which is nuts. I mean, I don't know anybody that does that. And you can also use cactus needles, but, you know, I don't have a cactus. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the incredible jet-propelled 8-track player. Well, I keep a, a portable player in the bathroom, um, and I play tapes when I'm taking a shower. I usually keep about a dozen tapes to choose from, and it just, it gets the day off to a nice start for me. I never really think about it being that unusual, even though some people, when they come over, you know, th comment on it, they, they think maybe it's a little odd. These uh, vinyl-covered 8-track um, carousels are really nice, even though they don't hold many tapes. I think they were designed just to look nice sitting on an end table. New York, New York, and the woman known as Our Lady of the 8-track, Abigail Levine. She agreed to help us with research on the father of 8-track, William Lear. And though she needs no introduction, here it is. Hi, I'm Abby Levine, the 8-track librarian. I think librarians get a pretty bad rap in this society. People think that we're staid and stodgy, old-fashioned. Well, not me, baby. While I may be a librarian, I'm also a swingin' 8-track chick. One of the key attributes of librarians, go-go and otherwise, is patience. Our first attempt to contact the William Lear Library began as an encounter with a fabled, never-ending ringing tone. By sheer force of will, we finally triumphed. Sort of. Clear, Jeff. Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in research.
searching uh, 8-track cartridges. I understand that uh, William Lear, who also founded Learjet, uh, invented 8-track. Do you know any of the patent numbers? Do you have any patent numbers there that you could give me? Uh, I, I know uh, of the 8-track and uh, that Learjet was involved, but well, I couldn't could you, give you... Um, well, what about other... Do you know about the Lear archives in Nevada? Do you have a contact number or someone I could call about that? Or uh, there, there may be someone, but I don't think uh, uh, I would be able well, to... Well, what about other things to do with A-Track? I mean, there must be a depository somewhere. Is there... Uh, but there's, we have a, a library, but uh, yes, I, but, not, uh, but um, what about things to do with eight track? Can you can you suggest further resources for information about eight track? Uh, not offhand, but perhaps a uh, museum. We turned our sights to getting a Library of Congress number for eight track mind and got lucky, sort of. Okay, you need to write or call the Library of Congress National Serial Data Program. When what sort of information do I need to send you? Okay. Now that I don't know. Uh, let me give you his phone number. You can call. Oh, excellent. Thank okay. you. Hi. You've reached the Library of Congress Cataloging and Distribution Services. No one is available to answer your call at the present time. However, if you leave your name, number and a brief message we'll get back to you as soon as possible thank you yes i'm calling on behalf of russ forster eight track mind publications post office box nine zero east detroit michigan four eight oh two one zero zero nine zero i need an application for an issn number thank you our afternoon of telephone research finally paid off when i received the proper application in the mail after filling it out and sending it off to the proper authorities it wasn't long before i got a letter informing me of my brand spanking new issn number I'm preparing for a radio show tonight. I have to queue up a bunch of 8-tracks. That might be the only drawback, really, to the 8-track format, is that it's not as easy to queue up as some other formats. We took our quest for 8-track truth to the streets, where graphic artist and performer Brenda DeValance had it plastered to light poles and park benches. We asked him to read 8-track poems to go with his 8-track art as it appeared across New York in 1994. The ages are alive on 8-track tonight. The soul of existence, the hum of screwdrivers, busting open the jammed, the wound and unwound. I get it in my soul like a fly in ointment. The hands down, no segue. Time elapsed in the space between tracks clicked. You get me high, a track tape. I get the punch in my stomach. Do you get the feeling, the one that bleeds you dry? The hold on and break down sometimes? The track change up mid-song, fixing to die blues? I got them in pants, and I rallied against the storm. Beat up this time for sure, portable 8-track plane, we will live again. If we could all, just for a moment, be so real and content as to have no dream of heaven not attainable on earth. Real dreams on 8-track flew, unknown and foamy, hot glue. I replaced the foam, and the money goes on forever. We replaced the 8-track, and history is our only martyr. Near scenic and historic Woodstock, New York, lives Althea Lolia, the first 8-track car enthusiast in this film for those keeping score. It all started for me with um, the Queen jazz tape. I was working at an art supply store in town, and uh, the people who lived upstairs were moving out. It was still in the wrapper. It was still in the cellophane, and uh, I picked it up, brought it in, and said, damn, this would be great. If I could only have an 8-track player in my car, I was driving a uh, 76 Volari at the time, and uh, I just thought it would be appropriate. Um, I no longer have the car. I used to call it the Silver Sal. Um, that's irrelevant. Anyway, I uh, told all my coworkers that that's what I really wanted, and if they ever found one, you know, pick it up. I'd be willing to pay up to $25 for an 8-track player. 
um, about 15 minutes later, my coworker came in and said, go in the office, you know, thinking, what have I done? And on the desk was my 8-track player. The people upstairs had thrown it out with the rest of the 8-tracks, and so basically it was free. Johnny Cash, a staple. You can't have an 8-track player without Johnny Cash. Um, there's a signed Wallace Davenport. You probably don't know who Wallace Davenport is, but it's signed. It's worth something. Um, let's see. Elvis at Madison Square Garden. Karate chops, the, the scarf, giving the scarf to the ladies, it's all in here. He blathers a little bit, too. And finally, one of my collection of five Bebop Deluxe. This is drastic plastic. Had it when I was about, ooh, 11. And I've got it now on track. Drive through town, Johnny Cash cranked, windows open. You kind of want people to know you're listening to Johnny Cash on an 8-track player. In the city, you worry about stuff like, you know, people climbing into your place 3 o'clock in the morning, sawing off the bars on your window. Here, you don't worry. You worry if the, the tape breaks. I don't know how to repair them, so that's a pretty big worry. And if I get in an accident changing tracks. Well, it's a rock and roll yard sale, so come on down. We're selling stuff that we would otherwise... This is Laura, Laura Levine. She's my upstate neighbor. She lives down in the city. We like to call people like that weekend scum. She's also a fierce eight-track competitor, so beware. <laughs> beware. She says she's not a collector, but... I'm not really a collector. She most certainly is. Laura, how'd you get started on eight-tracks? Well, Althea, um, sort of by default, actually. I bought a... Most um, of us do. As you know, I am a yard sale and auction and flea market fanatic. Yes. And I picked up a stereo several years ago for $30, and it happened to have an 8-track player in it. And within several weeks, the needle on the phonograph broke, and I haven't been able to fix it, so I've just been using the 8-track player in my studio. I hit the yard sales every weekend, get up real early, well, Friday night, plan it out in the newspaper. Early Saturday morning, I'm out there all day. We're missing one today on Maverick Road, by the way. A big house. Oh, but I figured, yeah, yard sales. there'll be more. Yard there'll sale. be more. It didn't seem like an 8-track house. Cambridge, Massachusetts is where I first realized that trackers existed outside of Chicago. Five years ago, I ran into other A-track mines on Massachusetts Avenue, where I hung out at the Bargain Basement Thrift Store. We came back to gather stories from recordist musician Eric Lindgren, Jack of All Trades specialist Phil X. Milstein, and writer talk show host Pagan Kennedy. A-track to me has some sound deficiencies, but to sum it up, it kind of has a sexy sound. Even classical music, I mean, has a pretty sexy sound to it. I do collect 8-tracks. I'm not an obsessive fanatic, and I do not play them. I don't have an 8-track player, and I wouldn't mind having one. But the reason that I buy them without playing them is I still have in the back of my mind, I'm preparing in the event that uh, some kind of long-distance auto or uh, truck trip, some driving trip might come up where the only source of, of music is in, eight, in, the, in the vehicle is an 8-track player. When I started writing my 70s book, I found a nostalgia book from the 50s which seemed really primitive compared to the nostalgia books that we're used to now of, with spot illustrations and lots, lots of little broken up trivia pieces. It was all big photos and long, coherent explanations, and I thought, well, what's happened? Why, um, w you know, why do we see history so differently? And I really think it's um, that since the 70s, we've learned to break things up into little sound bites. I love 8-tracks because they are so wrong that they're right. And, and history has become discontinuous. They're probably the dumbest uh, form of, of music uh, uh, format to be released that I'm aware of. Uh, they make no sense because the companies did not like having any dead time on the tapes. Unlike cassettes, very few 8-track players have a fast-forward button, so the companies releasing them would rearrange the tracks uh, from the original concept of the record. They would 
stop songs or, or, or cut a song in the middle and, and run it over two tracks so you hear this loud kerchunk in the middle. The sound quality is bad. The graphics are virtually useless. Uh, they're totally dumb, and that's part of what I love about them is I guess I liken them to, uh, well, my sister has a couple of black labs, and 8-tracks are sort of like that. They're, they're big, they're dumb, but they're sweet, and uh, basically they get the job done. There's sort of myth or cliche about the 70s that nothing happened then, nothing important went on, it was a dead time. But actually if you look around, I became interested, I was writing the book, just looking at the inst every institution we take for granted, I think, came about in the 70s. I'd never heard of Laura Lee before 8-Track, but this, I just think this cover is really nice. It's called Women's Rights. Here on this silly looking Velvet Underground compilation. There are two magnum opuses. Sister Ray is broken in half. Heroin is broken in half. I guess you call it a Learjet design or a Lear. Really nice. See that N? That looks really nice sticking out of your car. A track player. This, this is um, the music to watch girls by. Um, you know, the boys watch the girls watch the boys watch the girls. Island Records had a line of discontinued eight tracks all at once. You'd find uh, Here Come the Warm Jets and Somewhere Here is the End by Nico. Uh, among my favorite albums. Lots of Roxy music, although I was never big into them. Occasionally when I'd be looking for these rare records, uh, I would find eight tracks. So I built up a substantial eight track collection of oddball pieces like the first Krabby Appleton album, the Stooges Funhouse album, the GTOs, but it really seemed that at that time the 8-track had very heavy bass when I'd play it in the car. Jim Brown is in the movie Slaughter's Big Rip Off, and, but it's a James Brown um, soundtrack and in the movie the evil guy is played by Ed McMahon and it's just so perfect. Um, because it's like the Ed McMahon that you always knew he was, you know, and he's pretending to be really nice on Johnny Carson, but he's really this kind of sleazy mafioso guy. This here's one of my prized possessions, uh, the official version. This here is the bootleg version, uh, the, we'll say, southern truck stop version. Uh, there's a disclaimer on the cover, and there's no way you can tell by looking at the front. Maybe on the back is where it lists Sex Pistols in the song titles. The disclaimer on the front reads, Fantastically accurate recreations of the top chart hits played by our studio musicians. Warning, it is expressly forbidden to copy this recording in any manner or form. Well, I've always been uh, obsessed with thrift stores. When I was a kid, I used to collect man um, those styrofoam wig heads. I, I didn't even know why I was doing it, but I was I was fascinated with the idea that there was so much amazing stuff, so cheap, and it was sort of being recycled. Um, you know that the, there was this endless cycle of things changing hands, and then you know after you owned it, it would go somewhere else, and so it was a sort of continuity between people, and it, it was so different from everything else in our culture which is so disposable and and has no personality the velvet underground 1969 live album uh on vinyl was the very this was the very first uh velvet underground album i ever got and led to a, a massive obsession with them that that pretty much holds to this day the eight track version however is the only eight track that i know of the album was a double album the A track is what they call highlights of, and it's just uh, selections. And they discarded a number of tracks, a number of songs from the original album of it. Um, I remember about 1979 driving down to New York with a friend of mine <clears throat> to see uh, what we thought was Patti Smith Group appearing under an uh, assumed name at CBGB's. And we got there, it turned out to be, uh, the assumed name was an actual group, and Patti Smith was nowhere to be seen. But they were the X-Ray Specs was headlining that weekend, and we got to see two sets of them, and uh, people now don't even know that X-Ray Specs ever played in this country, so I feel very privileged to have seen them, and it was magnificent, and 
we came, went back, drove back up to Western Mass that same night, and uh, it was pretty much dawn when we uh, emerged from the Lincoln Tunnel on the Jersey side with this going and with, it was a uh, new age was peaking and this massive full moon hanging right over the horizon of New York in orange and uh, just one of those kind of memorable moments in, in one's life. How could anyone want to go back to the low-tech world of 8-track? Why forsake the sturdy CD for that chunky plastic cassette with its flimsy strip of tape that has become notorious for the way it inevitably snaps in half? But don't join the scoffers. Instead, recognize the technology's one that tried too much too soon. Like Icarus flying too close to the sun, 8-track died because it attempted greatness. John's children was kind of a mod power pop band from England. A uh, few things about them. Uh, Peter Townshend supposedly was in their fan club. They got a lot of press. They used to do kind of mod pop art events where they'd have these crazy things happening at their shows. The one thing about John's Children, though, is they're inept. They were a terrible band and they couldn't really play their instruments. They did have Mark Bowling join up with them for a small couple of months, but basically they were a terrible band. They made these okay records. The drummer was probably the best musician in the bunch. But anyway, uh, they cut those singles, then they disappeared, and then around 70, 71, this album came out in America called Orgasm by John's Children. It was a live album, and what they did is they dubbed all this atrocious crowd noise on top of this these studio demos that were just inept. I can't describe it as anything more. But it was something that really fascinated me. So uh, I was never really able to get the album. But I walked into town and country on one of my adventures using my mom's car. Walked in, was looking at some of the cutouts. I think I bought the Rolling Stones uh, Live As You Want It as a mono cutout for like a buck ninety-eight. But I walked over to the eight tracks, and lo and behold, I found circa around 72, the legendary Orgasm, John's Children album on eight track. Blew my mind, so I got it. Uh, I paid whatever it was, a buck ninety-eight at the counter, and I've seen a lot of rare records in my time, but that probably made me shake more than any other record I've ever had. Bob Jordan has been holding thousands of 8-tracks in a shed behind his humble house in Grafton, Massachusetts for over a decade. Unfortunately, none of the titles include work by Michael Hurley, Bob's longtime pal and musical collaborator. So when we heard that Mr. Hurley was playing one of his infrequent shows nearby, we were determined to pay a visit to them both. What about that rig you got in there, Elwood? Your well, uh, eight-track rig. This is one of the finest that was made. In the this was uh, the peak of development when they uh, around 71, 72. Uh, the good old the days. The Craig power play, 12 watts per channel, with a uh, throbulation light that that glows big red when you hit the peaks there in the volume. And the four colors that show you what channel you're on. I'd like to present the gentleman from the 8-track mine, this nice cowboy Copus 8-track. Do you think they'll like it? The piece of junk, it's got, it's, it's like a one-cut authentic stars and guest series. It's pasted on there at the last minute. Frankie Miller, Red Henderson, and also one appearance by the late cowboy Copus. I think that'd be an insult, really. No, Frankie Thank Miller you. was good. Frankie Miller did a... Uh, uh, Black Dirt Farmer. He, he was well, as big as Cowboy Copaz. Yeah. No. I think it's bogus. I, I think that you could probably pick up something better. Well, it really says Cowboy Grabass actually uh, sings the song that was written by Cowboy Copas. This is a fake. <laughs> it is. It's, a, it's one of Who those. Cowboy it's, Grabass. It's lower than a bootleg. <laughs> All right, this is the Blue Navigator from the Keystone State. How are we doing? Big ho hum on that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, remember the time in '85 before all this eight-track madness started, when we suggested to the rounder people that they needed to liquidate their inventory? Ah, uh, yes. Went in there with the blazer, didn't we? Yeah, we had two vehicles. 
and we filled them up to the brim. Thousands of eight tracks. Yeah, I think it was 1,800 tapes, 40 titles. Many still over there. They're in all the in the shed. Yes, Not they're all, all in the shed. We have. Uh, we, I still have the invoice for that. Do you want to take care of that? After taking a peek inside the van that Michael Hurley calls home, it was time to hit the gig, where we were greeted by the master of ceremonies for the evening, the smooth-talking Bobby Suit. But this is good. We've got a good night tonight. It's really good, you know, down here at Lucky's. You know, feeling lucky, feeling good, good-looking crowd, good-looking audience. Looking bad. I like that. It's really good. Looking bad. Yeah, bad is good, you know what I mean? I know what I'm talking about. It's great, huh? These guys over here, you see these guys with the... They've traveled all over the country talking about 8-Tracks, and they produce 8-Track Mind. It's a magazine all about 8-Tracks. It's a really, really beautiful, uh, really beautiful uh, magazine here. And, uh, you know, it's got, like, articles, uh, writing, uh, letters to the editor. And it gets, uh, like, like this one here. I mean, I love the way people are so expressive. It says, uh, I was so excited when I nervously pushed it into the little slot. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. And it hurt that. <laughs> I guess it has a feel, you know what I mean? That's the thing I like about 8 tracks. You know what I mean? It has a... Ooh, you know, it has that last little... published a terrific magazine called the Duplex Planet for well over a decade. Michael Hurley drew the cover for this issue, filled with often naive nuggets of wisdom from nursing home residents. But David most wanted to talk about his graphic art experience relating to 8-Track, and his funny Michael Hurley stories. One of my favorite things that Michael Hurley told me was uh, about 8-Tracks was that he got into jazz because of liking to play 8-Tracks while he was painting. And as things would, he said, as things would come around the second time, if they were anything that had regular song structures with lyrics, he would know that it was coming around again, and he would just like to forget about how much time had gone by and just keep painting. And he said with jazz, it would play two or three times, and he wouldn't be aware of the fact that it was repeating itself. And the other thing he told me was about um, saving the, his broken eight tracks. If it was one that meant a lot to him, he would toss it into a shoebox and plan on fixing it later, and he would fix them later when he couldn't get to sleep at night. The first album cover I did was this one for NRBQ, Tiddlywinks, and it's the only thing that I've done that's come out in all formats. Well, all formats up to now. It's on vinyl, cassette, 8-track, and CD now. And the 8-track, I was very proud of because it's the only time one of the covers I did came out on an 8-track. Uh, the cassette, the cassette doesn't matter. Uh, the cassette and the 8-track would just be adapted from this at the time, so there's no back cover on here. But the cassette, it's not even worth mentioning. Cassettes are the only format that you find lying in the gutter. I suppose you used to find 8-tracks in the gutter. Sometimes people would heave them out of the car. But uh, cassettes, actually, I've got a friend who throws the covers for cassettes away. He thinks that they're already in a case, meaning the plastic that they're in, and he throws the cases away, which I find sort of troubling since I make covers, but amazing that he does that. I think if 8-Tracks uh, had sort of caught on in a bigger way right across the culture through all different strata of people, that we'd be seeing packaging with 8-Tracks that would be more like what's happened with CDs, where um, there's interesting information with it in booklets. As it worked out, though, you know, eight tracks just ended up being a formula way to drop information in. They weren't ever about design or graphics. There would always just be a space where you drop in the album cover art. That sometimes they would just shoot 
the finished albums. They wouldn't even be using, going back to the same mechanicals or, or stripping new art. They would just shoot right from that and then drop in the song titles only. You never knew who did the covers, who wrote the songs, any of that stuff, because it just didn't matter for this. And in fact, sometimes you had a hard time seeing certain ones. You could see the song titles sticking out of the player, but that just was never an issue. Finishing our 10,000 mile loop back in Chicago, we paid a visit to Dwayne Tham Jr. He told us of his unpleasant encounter with Columbia House Record Club and his resolve to keep a track alive despite the odds. We were receiving current tapes from Columbia House. When they sent me a letter telling me that they would only offer CDs and cassettes, I was pretty ticked off, so I wrote him a letter back and I told them if they wanted me to stay a member that they would have to send me a tracks But they just sent me a blurred letter and and I got really ticked off, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of really depressing that uh, my format is dead. And I don't think it is. And so I wanted to, like, get revenge on Columbia House. And I wrote them letters, and my friends wrote them letters. John and I are still into Atrex because of the superb sound quality. It is really, really good. Plus, we have one in our car, too. And uh, no one's ever stole our A-Track player out of the car or ever stolen our excellent tapes, you know, so it's like really a plus for that. And I, I DJ at a club, and also I use these at the club for dance mixes, and I, I make my own tapes. And no one's ever stolen those, and I leave them laying all around the bar, too. For those of you who think that A-Tracks didn't survive the 80s, they in fact did, and here's proof. Here's U2, the Joshua Tree. And here's Michael Jackson, even bad. He's pretty bad. Here's the 1988 Summer Olympics. I wonder how many of you guys have that. But yes, in fact, it was made. And, and Bruce Springsteen, Tunnel of Love. We have uh, Prince, Sign of the Times. And to the best of my knowledge, this was the last A-Track that I received from Columbia House, which is probably the last A-Track issued. This is Chicago 19. In our household, Madonna is the queen of A-Track. We have quite a few. We even have more than one copy of uh, You Can Dance. Who's that girl? That too. And we have an acetate cutting machine, and we put Madonna on 78 so we can play her on the wind-up machine. That's kind of cool. We like that. All our friends think we're nuts, but hey, we got these and they don't. I DJ at a club called The Hideaway in Forest Park, and I pre-record my own A-Tracks. When I work, when I DJ, I record it to a 90-minute A-Track, and later on that week, if I want to take a long 90-minute break, I can just pop an A-Track in, and people dance to a 90-minute A-Track and don't even know they're dancing A-Tracks. You can't even tell them. No, yeah. No clicks. No. CD quality. Right, CD quality. Yeah, it's really cool. Even the little clicks that go by through the channels, you don't even hear those. Screw 
Here are some of the bigger themes that we ran into in our loop around the U.S. One, Panasonic players are beautiful and bountiful. Two, Goodwill stores should be avoided at all cost. Three, Weltronic space helmet players are the most highly coveted ones on the Earth. And four, choosing A-Track does not have to be a trite act of nostalgia. It can be a political act, as significant as burning a plastic American flag that was made in Taiwan or buying your entire wardrobe from a local thrift store. The A-Track lifestyle is not for everyone, but it is a serious alternative for those who feel betrayed by the masters of marketing, who constantly tell us what to hear and how to hear it. So what if the tape unravels and grinds to a cacophonous halt in the player? I'd rather feel pain than feel numb. Jeff and I, we used to go to uh, Wilco, this little discount store on the western suburbs which no longer exists for you younger viewers. And uh, they had a pretty cool cutout section. I mean, we could Monty Python records and whatnot, and they had jillions of, of uh, A-tracks, you know, Beatles stuff that were probably bootlegs and Beethoven and all this other shit. And uh, Jeff had heard of this guy, Lou Reed. So when he saw a Lou Reed A-track, he thought, ooh, let's get this Lou Reed A-track. I heard he's good. And it turned out to be metal machine music. And uh, we had no idea what this was going to sound like. I don't know if Jeff had heard the Velvets or solo stuff or what, but we took it home and popped it in the player, and, you know, all this god-awful noise came out. And we just sort of looked at each other and hit the button and got more god-awful noise. And this went on for a little while, and he just yanked it out. He was like, I can't listen to this. And uh, he traded it to me for a copy of, uh, I think, the Yes album or something. Jeff had this car, this, I don't know, 74 or something, Mercury Monarch, which we called the Mercury Anarch. And it had an eight-track player in the dash. I pulled out the Metal Machine music tape, and he was like, uh, I don't, I don't know about this. But I insisted it get put on, and it got put on. And we ended up in Uptown somehow, and we just drove around Uptown for, I, I don't know how long, and got the stereo up as loud as we could go, and just drove around, and we'd pull up by the curb, and people would be standing there having this conversation, and they'd just sort of stop and look. <laughs> and shake their heads and, and get this quizzical expression like, what the hell is wrong with that car? And uh, well, thank God we weren't shot. I guess that's, I guess that's the real point of the story.